Right now, um, so for people online, you're not getting the uh, immediate benefit of this particular piece of paper, which is not so much a menu as a sort of indication of contents, which you can interrogate uh, later. Behind me is the first page uh, of this, which I shall endeavour to talk to. And um, I say, don't interrupt me too much, much in the first few minutes, unless it's really uh, necessary. But as we go on, I shall become, you know, more open to feedback. Okay, so my title is What, Whence and Whither Cybernetics? And hopefully it's complementary to what Bill has just given us, which is a number of very important and I think basic uh, uh, areas of science, cybernetics, very well grounded. This, the grounding of this may be more like uh, reading um, James Joyce's Ulysses, but let's, let, let's see how we interpret it. Uh, okay, so subject, a lot of cyberneticians and a lot of people on the edge of cybernetics or outside it, actually worry and ask themselves what uh, is cybernetics are we are we okay is there some <coughs> fundamental problem here we've got all these other um areas um around uh, to jump on to my third paragraph this is not unique uh to cybernetics uh Psychology has its has had its phases of anxiety, uh, anxiety crisis or identity crisis. Economics. We all know that students around the world have been protesting about how ineffective um, a great deal of what they are taught is. Uh, you, uh, people, people, even. In physics, sociobiology had to rebrand itself as evolutionary psychology because it got itself such a bad name the first way round, round, time round. Sometimes you get a subject which starts off arguably, or in retrospect, on the wrong foot, wrong foot. arguably astrology, which uh, turned into astronomy or alchemy, which turned into chemistry. Philosophy tends to keep dismantling itself and then, uh, trying to tell all the other sciences what uh, they are allowed to think and what they're not allowed to think as it reconstructs its own domains or sort of forms different schools and so forth. Uh, again, the studies of religion, the studies of, 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 of theology, uh, which one is really at the truth, the revealed truth, the subjective truth, the truth of the... Um, theologian talking to a bishop is a lot different to uh, talking to a born again christian about what uh, ultimate, ultimately is so i've given you a whole list of um areas there where people um are not sure really uh, absolutely the grounds of what their subject is so we we're in good company uh, in being a little bit unsure of ourselves. Other things you um, need to bear in mind can consider is what legitimates knowledge? What is the sociology? Uh, is epistemology pretty trivial and it's all about uh, sociology of knowledge? What influences uh, people to believe one thing rather than another thing and you get academic trends, just as you get uh, trends in main culture of whether you believe in a form of democracy or lack of democracy or centralization, um, we believe in. Uh, and the other thing one's got to be aware of when one does try to do so-called hard science and produce papers, even though science is arguably the best uh, tool we have uh, for knowing when we are wrong, is that an awful lot of uh, scientific papers published, the more prestigious the journal, uh, the less likely things in it, the results are to be true, according to John Ionides, who's uh, 
if you want to get in a major journal, find out, uh, produce a result which is spectacular. If that result is spectacular, the odds are that it's a statistical artifact, um, that it's actually wrong. This is quite a big crisis in psychology, but uh, it's fairly well across the, um, ac across the field. Uh, especially where uh, studying of human beings in some way is involved. Uh, and then with cybernetics, we're a numerically smaller group of scholars, studiers, whatever you, uh, a smaller community, and therefore we're more prone to be swayed one way or another, and we're more open to definition graphs than uh, other subjects. You may uh, remember the line of the um, Thomas Sass, anti-psychiatrist, who said, in the jungle it's eat or be eaten, in the human world it's define or be defined. And you get definition wars as to what is the true economics or the best uh, psychological experiments or uh, approach and if you get enough people citing you well that makes it true doesn't it and obviously the high strategy is very gameable um, and we have to ask ourselves since we're looking at cybernetics as a subject in my talk here what is our own psych uh, sociology or sociology of knowledge in cybernetics how prone are we to these sort of infections which other subjects get. So this isn't entirely the cybernetics of cybernetics, it may be the sociology or the epistemology and various other library sounds uh, of cybernetics. Uh, but uh, one thing I notice uh, as I get older is that I go to meetings which are dominated by people in my demographic and uh, after many years of study, they have come to certain absolute truths which they believe in, and they are very keen to get across to everybody else. Uh, so when I say uh, old um, men with theory of everything uh, filters, one can spend an academic career building up a certain perspective, a certain way of looking at the world and as new phenomena come in, in this kind of Kuhnian sense, which um, Bill was talking about, with increasingly awkward uh, adjustments, you manage to integrate those things into your filter of uh, understanding. And you're probably familiar with the um, uh, phrase by, you could tell me who the scientist who said science does not advance by uh, argument, uh, rational argument, but by the death, by the death of old men. So, uh, <laughs> having uh, and I, I've, I've mentioned uh, in that paragraph some examples which may or may not resonate uh, with you of how people tend to build up theories which explain everything. Uh, just to hammer the illustration through, I once had a lodger who was very interested in conflict theory. And so the only way you could get into a conversation with him or pay attention to him was by talking to him about conflictual situations. Hence, all of these who knew the man and knew how to calm him down and interest him, talk to him uh, about this sort of theory. Therefore, he got an increasingly affirmed worldview of the centrality of, let's say, conflict rather than cooperation, interaction, dancing, whatever you would like to um, call it. So going back to uh, my second paragraph at the top here, uh, what is a subject? Uh, Aristotle had a little bit of a go at it, sort of trying to clump similar things together. There has not been a lot of uh, discussion in the 20th century as to what makes 
a subject among philosophers of science. 19th century, John Stuart Mill has uh, a go, various others. However, if you, uh, so when I was trying to figure out what is the nature of the um, subject entity, if such it is, of cybernetics, I found myself going to the, libra the librarians and I'm aware that there are professors of library science in this building who will probably tell me that I'm fairly out of date now. However, back in the 20s and 30s, um, a chap called Ranganathan found, decided that the existing Dewey classifications and universal decimal classifications weren't quite right. Necessarily, a librarian has to sort of spread knowledge along a linear continuum so it can fit on library shelves. And although potentially we're capable of better than that with uh, IT nowadays, it still tends to be a trope uh, in human thinking. However, uh, and Ranganathan has produced various uh, characterizations of theories uh, of subjects which hold together. I mean, there's scholarly accord, there's tradition, uh, there's how one thing um, fits with another, what things seem to group together and so forth, and how close it appears to be at some level of abstraction to the next subject along your line. However, he recognised that a linear um, categorization of knowledge is, at best, um, a useful fig fiction. So he introduced something called the colon uh, classification, which uh, gave you other aspects than the stuff before the decimal point in the old Dewey, Dewey classification, if you remem remember that. And he formulated various aspects, um, facets that you could sort of break down and add on. I mean, I'm, it's in my, my thesis online, if, you, if, if you're ever motivated to check out finer details, but personality, matter, energy, space, time aspects of the um, particular subject. And what was interesting, and incidentally that was then developed and accepted by revised Dewey Decimal Classification and Universal Classification. Um, an interesting article appeared after a few years about the reception of cybernetics uh, into the revised classification system. And when I say around the third line that cybernetics has had three different uh, classifications in that uh, system, I'm one out. It started, it's actually had four. It entered related to biology and mass, this is cybernetics. Then they decided, no, no, no. And it became a division of mass. So if we're talking about one non-linear mathematics, as we were quite a lot in the previous talk, that will help with a lot of it. Uh, then it got a something, a status, what, what Ranganathan called a distilled main subject in dealing with integrated wholes. Uh, and then finally, um, it uh, got um, uh, put in as a main subject with a, a position between maths and physics. Some of you in this room may be happy with that and think, yes, yes, yes. And some of you may be thinking, oh my God, this really misses the point. Okay. So, um, you, why do you actually care uh, whether something is a subject or isn't, isn't a subject? What would you actually like a subject to be? Um, we've all heard, you know, the name, the word is not the thing. Uh, if it's not a medium-sized dry good, uh, then maybe the language we're using to it and we try, we, we're trying to treat it, our thoughts about it are not wholly um, appropriate. So you could say, yeah, cybernetics is real, it's there. You could say it's pragmatic. 
uh, looking at things this way could be useful. Uh, if you're me, you would say, idealistically perhaps, I want to understand the common properties of large complex systems and large complex systems generally seem to be purpose-like. Sometimes I seem crazy, but uh, at, at other times there is teleonomy apparent uh, movement towards uh, a goal in it. Uh, but obviously uh, any one of the games in academia is not to be too transparently lucid, otherwise you'll be accused of triviality. So if you can wrap things up in a way which makes people do a double take, yeah, it, it, it may assist with um, your CV and people, I, don't, I think the area of business studies uh, very often picks up bits of popular psychology which you should have dropped rather quickly but um, then whether, whether that's something about the characteristics of businessmen, whether, sorry, business people, whether, they're, uh, whether they believe this stuff or whether they are recognising a good market um, is, yeah, open to your um, judgment. Okay. Um, so, uh, some, uh, one of my bet noirs is uh, when people have come along and said, uh, right, uh, I am using a systems approach or even a cybernetics approach uh, to this, this problem. And because systems thinking is su superior to the essentially essentialist worldview that I know about uh, of Plato that there's an absolute table and an absolute cat somewhere out there and you're, when, when, when you look at uh, things that there's a perfect example, exemplar somewhere out in what we would probably call hyperspace nowadays but um, I'm afraid most, most of what I've read of Plato I've re read from popular books and my son um, trying to educate me. So, uh, and what I have seen as uh, one of the better, uh, more useful ancient Greek uh, approaches is some of uh, what, well, Heraclitus talking about you never step into the same river twice, everything is in flux and change. And then, um, Aristotle, a, a number of people have written about Aristotle's systems approach. When last night I went on images to um, identify uh, diagrams of Aristotle's uh, systems approach, mostly it was tree uh, diagrams which have their uses. Trees are, you know, pretty functional ways of being. Uh, but I think there was only about one circular diagram and it was uh, about the movement of societies from a low order of civic togetherness uh, where, you know, might was more obviously right to a higher level of civic awareness where you um, wrote the rules and uh, people had to accord to them. Although, as a digression, one of my, another of my favourite lines uh, comes from the poet and philosopher Emerson writing about British history and the Norman Conquest. And he said, the warlords became the law lords. If you can write the law, if you can be the definers, then you reduce conflict. Uh, if you can get an accord among viewers as to what is the case, which is to some extent what we are trying to do um, in cybernetics. Uh, but as I say, with, with, with systems and a systems approach, if you're just putting a few blobs around with lines between them with one way or two way arrows and so on, arguably there are more permutations of ways to be wrong when you do that than with a simple linear causal domino falling uh, 
chain. So we do need to be very self-critical once we've got a few useful basic um, ideas. Uh, so what is the point of turning knowledge in, subjecting knowledge, putting it in subjecting knowledge, okay, uh, double meaning there guys. Um, uh, part of it, it's a search strategy enabling us to find stuff, I mean it'd be interesting to model where various bits of knowledge uh, are stacked up in my brain and your brains, and I know there's holistic theories about, and holographic theories of, of uh, knowledge, information, storage, but it's definitely there are some specific bits of the brain, it's not one uh, holographic mush. Uh, so search strategy is one reason. Pedagogical convenience. I found myself teaching uh, access students at Thames Valley University about 20 years ago, and I was told I had to teach them systems analysis, so I thought, okay, I can bluff my way in that. But then it turned out that I got to teach them a very specific uh, sort of uh, systems analysis, SSADM, Structured Systems Analysis and Design Method. I had to look it up again uh, this morning. And uh, when I talked to my friends who were real good systems analysts and programmers, and so on, they said, it's pretty useless, Dave, but, uh, but I've got to teach this. Why do I have to teach this? Well, because it's teachable stuff. And some of what we're talking about, the pedagogy of um, cybernetics, we teach stuff because it's easy to teach or more precisely, because it's easy for us to teach. So as a um, former Ofsted um, lead inspector, I used to say there is a terrible problem of mathematical understanding in the education system. Most of it is focused at the Department for Education and the research section of Ofsted. They uh, a lot of but move, moving down, we abandoned something called new maths back in the 70s, partly because a lot of teachers didn't get it. I found it pretty straightforward teaching elementary robotics to um, kids at the top of middle school, that's what, 10 to 12 uh, years old. Took a lot longer uh, for the, well, we never really got there with the adults, uh, but gradually they got there with some of the other IT things. So we tell you know, the, the inertia of the educational system, you know, we must teach people what frontal pronouns are or, or whatever, is part of what is carrying us along. And how we do better than that is probably not only through the education system. I and mean, there are bits in, there were bits in the national curriculum which you would say, yeah, this is a way into cybernetics, but when I talk children labelled gifted and talented across the London borough of Brent, I found that almost always they were getting more of their information from outside of school lessons than they were from inside. So we've got to put stuff out there, create what um, uh, the guy who invented Logo, I'll come in a while, uh, a mathetic environment. The point being, you don't need to go into long explanations of what a wheel is if you're in an environment full of wheels. If you're not, people may struggle um, with that notion. And if you've had a certain filters uh, built into your way of seeing, uh, you may not see what somebody else sees is actually there. I mean, we've all heard probably about characterizations of the um, different ways people are sensibly from the west and the east look at the fish camp and uh, the Americans look at the fish and uh, people allegedly in Japan look at the processes and the interactions uh, of the fish. This has got to be too simplistic but the notion that we build ourselves up to see certain things which is why people my, end up, my age end up with theories of everything which they want to uh, reassure themselves by blasting into everybody else's brains is 
uh, an iter a repeated um, phenomena. Uh, so, yeah, subjects are used. They give you some way in. They give you some way of manipulating things. Uh, you you could say uh, uh, Les Johnson, who is a head of school of um, maths and computing at Brunel, but got his PhD in cybernetics there first, simply regarded cybernetics as an excuse to do interdisciplinary studies. Uh, that may be good, that may be right. I don't think uh, most of us here would feel he'd got it right. And as, as somebody who, <laughs> uh, as a student, learned to criticise uh, uh, lecturers very early on, because it was authenticated, perhaps, uh, in that time, one of the best things one of our lecturers said to us when we asked him about the theory of the head of uh, school, his pet theory was one of the most useful things I learned as a, a young man was that you can be very, very clever and very, very wrong. So uh, I'm sure you'll find quite a few uh, uh, I hope I'm clear enough to for it to be clear when I am wrong um, here. Uh, so. May, may, maybe the notion of subject is over coalesced, over reified, and we need some way of breaking it up. And maybe that's what cybernetics is doing for us to a degree. Maybe um, we um, are just handing tools for new ways of looking over to people. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves what ought people to know or to be better at? Curriculum theories, we've got to educate people for democracy. There's many different forms and layers and thickness of democracy. And uh, if you've ever been an autocrat trying to make something uh, on top of an organisation which you're trying to make more democratic, it works up to a point. Then the amount of buzz and ideas that you get coming up from below, you think, hey, I'm going to close this down a bit. My head can't um, handle it. So, again, to some extent, as we all know, uh, issues in cybernetics take us on to uh, issues in values, morality, even though I think we do our philosophy and our philosophy of science and our less uh, aptly. Uh, uh, than some of the professionals in the field. So uh, my next um, provocation, well, well, I do say what ought people to know or be better at? There was a popular theory of mine, say 20 years ago, which was the Swiss Army knife theory of cognition, that our brain was built up of a set of tools which enabled us to do certain things uh, well, and they weren't very well connected, which uh, if you look at, say, the maths department at Trinity College, uh, you might say there was a connection between being good at maths and less good at social um, analysis, um, say. Uh, some of the things which are much harder to simulate in artificial intelligence take up quite a big uh, space in our brain. And if you can cut that out by being um, somewhat narrower in your focus, if you can live in a society where other people will do the social work uh, for you, then maybe you can push on in areas which other people haven't had the time or the opportunity to uh, develop their skills. And yeah, I'm quite aware that, you know, this leads us into you know, the whole issue of you know, uh, the amount of work which women are, have been expected to do informally uh, compared with old fashioned um, male academics. Okay, so my next provocation is, are people who don't get cybernetics just thick? Well, I can, Justify raising that question, Professor Felgate, who is Professor of um, Cybernetics at Reading up to about 1988, 
wrote one of these typical articles about students just aren't coming in well enough educated nowadays. And you say, they don't have the maths and they don't have the physics. We have to reteach them um, that. I think people have been saying that standards are dropping for a long time. Of course, we all know from our own subjective experience that they are um, now, so my son tells me. Uh, but to some extent, if one is brought up with a certain level of knowledge, which one gets, and the next generation comes up and learns other stuff, which one regards as trivial or delegatable. So we should probably be worried, but we shouldn't panic. Um, so, but it could be that uh, people who like generalizations uh, are going to be better uh, at cybernetics. Uh, if the Swiss Army knife theory of cognition uh, oh no, what's it? Um, is half true, then you know, there may be um, modularities and just as you know, we need variety in human bodies in the tribe, Sometimes small people with small hands can be useful. Um, so we need a variety of cognitive approaches in society, but too easily society runs to producing a predominant uh, viewpoint rather than uh, the kind of requisite variety, the diversity which could help us to handle things more effectively or could tie us all up in knots and people say, please, let a dictator take over, at least somebody who regards as a bit competent. Um, what, so, uh, one thing that when I did assessments of understanding of the notion of feedback on a variety of demographics, um, uh, was it nine to ten year olds, eleven, twelve year olds, late adolescents, uh, adult non graduates and graduates was that the ability to usefully generate and apply ideas of feedback went up something like this, an inverted U-curve. And this doesn't only happen in cybernetics. It, it, the research is showing it in other, other sorts of scientific theory up to a point. Um, as well, if the remain, if the dominant cultural um, agenda is a certain form of analysis, you will get good at that, and you will tend to block out other stuff. Just as if you go blind, your hearing will probably develop, uh, but <laughs> it's less likely to develop if you're using your eyes um, most of the time to get your information from. Okay, uh, but you know, I don't know if you've had many friends or relations who are, say, labelled as, say, paranoid or some forms of schizophrenia for what you know these um, mythologies are worth. You'll see some people jump, bunny hop, grasshopper from one idea to another and uh, think, oh yeah, that goes to that, oh wow, man, that's fabulous. Uh, I used to call, talk about parallel monologues when I was sitting as a student in a room full of people taking in some chemicals which used to give me a sore throat, so I didn't. And people would, you know, spout out about something and somebody would just pick on to one minor aspect of that, oh yeah, blah, blah. and they'd have this to and fro bat and ball, but there was, there was not a lot of sequence to it. Are we uh, in danger of seeing superficial similarities, which actually don't get you anywhere practically in cybernetics? What uh, does the local uh, beat, does that trump the generalization? Well, yes and no. Um, so uh, the other thing I found when I was um, assessing uh, understanding of just you know one particular dimension of cybernetic ideas was that there was no significant difference uh, between males and females in their understanding of this. Now Professor Simon Baron Cohen at Oxford 
has this theory that male brains, we tend to be more systematizers and therefore uh, maybe men are better at um, uh, forming big intellectual systems, but the downside is that we are more likely to be autistic. Um, I'm skeptical. One reason I'm skeptical is the person who's got the highest score in um, my assessments of people's ability to use, generate, apply feedback notions uh, was a woman whose first degree was in physics and her second degree was in design and she beat the two Oxbridge uh, guys I had in my sample. So let's say adults uh, will be worse at certain forms of systems thinking in our present society by and large than um, uh, our uh, you know, er, 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 early adolescents. There is, between graduates and non-graduates, there is an overlap. By and large, the graduates produce rather more and the um, non-graduates produce less. But maybe if I had produced more um, culturally appropriate exemplars to teach the subject, I would have got a different reaction. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so... Um, um, yeah, okay, I've done the counting to the mean population decline uh, of conventional IQ pr process. Uh, some of you, well, Bill anyway, will remember there was a philosopher of science who moved to psychology called Piaget, which we all, who we all had to learn about 30 or 40 years ago. And he talked about cognitive development, starting from just sort of fairly sensory feeling things and then moving to a stage of concrete operationalism uh, where you could see you would always obey rules, for example, because that was the rule and you had to follow it. If you talk to uh, children when you're trying to grade the school and spirituality, as Ofsted used to have to do uh, 20 odd years ago, they can tell you what's right and what's wrong. They can't tell you why something is right or why uh, something is wrong. They haven't got on to deontology or utilitarianism. So, you know, if you want to um, fail a cathedral school, you can always push that sort of uh, stuff in their direction. Um, so what, um, uh, what, what concrete operationalism suggests to us is that, uh, well, Piaget tried to say this was universal and once you became, transcended concrete operationalism to formal operationalism and this was based on you know the best logic of the 1920s uh, then you would do it across the whole piece which is not true I mean I talked about Einstein having a blind spot about the expanding universe uh, typically you can argue very rationally with people in subject areas where they have a mass of knowledge or no particular interest. When that is not the case, um, they're, they're more likely to become com uh, concrete operationalists <laughs> than formal operationalists. And again, in different cultures, Piaget was registering different levels of this, which for educational theory sort of takes you back to Vygotsky, a mythetic environment where you count on the bones of your hand rather than just the digits of your fingers, uh, will develop a stronger mathematical facility, arguably, than one which doesn't have those um, cultural tropes. So, um, uh, We've already had from Bill, uh, I've discreditable straws in the wind, uh, Venus withdrawn from the Macy conferences. I didn't realize that it was uh, for ethical reasons. I thought he just decided that some other form of mathematics was more fun. Various peoples right at the beginning of cybernetics uh, challenged uh, its program. Uh, the Rand Corporation, American think tanks, put up um, 
a lot they, of stuff about systems thinking, about games theoretic um, techniques of approaching things and advise the American um, military on that and lost the Vietnamese War. So Mike Robinson, who um, I mentioned here in his book groups, he was a good Marxist and he studied little Marxist groups uh, predominantly and he looked at the features which keep them going and uh, cause them to sort of fall apart and and end. And uh, his book was uh, published with a great big uh, subsidy from, I think it was the CIA, because obviously they're very interested in the behavior of Marxist groups and any other groups. But in the same uh, book, Groups by Mike Robinson, he points out that uh, cybernetically related things took something of a hit from the failure or the simplistic application let's say, of uh, theories of feedback, of simplistic game theory. I don't know if you've um, ever skimmed through the theory of games and economic behaviour von Neumann and Morgenstern, 1948. Uh, but if you, you come to the end of each chapter, and um, we've all heard about zero-sum games and non-zero-sum games. Um, in a zero-sum game, the ultimate thing is, if I am going to win, I'm going to sort of reproduce myself. What I really need to do, ultimately, is to wipe all of you out and everybody beyond here and fill the universe with clones and myself. That is the ultimate sort of winning power dynamics. It doesn't feel all that intellectually plausible, arguably, that, um, you know, getting to the top of the pyramid, which is the knowledge space at the top of the pyramid, is our, our ultimate goal in life, even though culturally that is pushed towards um, a lot of us uh, at the moment. Um, so uh, what, um, I've mentioned a few of the uh, misgivings uh, that people had about this thing. Oh yeah, what I was going to say about theory of games, and you don't, uh, von Neumann and Morgan Stern, at the end of each chapter, they managed to transform every non-zero-sum game, every win-win game, to say, into a zero-sum game. So, however, you know, if the collective product is taken on by one person, then, and uh, from this, inevitably, it's um, kind of mathematics being used to justify um, a, a form of interaction which uh, is kind of seductive, like people are attracted to watching fights, even though most of the time we are not fighting uh, and so on, but we want to ensure ourselves for, for those. Uh, it, it gives us a view of, let's say, evolution, uh, which legitimates maybe other aspects in society and just as economics and psychology, religion gets tied up with the social political zeitgeist uh, so at times may can could um cybernetics uh, so when back in 1972 uh, i was on the forward planning committee of the university of brunel university and i go into the room full of old men of 40 and uh, okay, there was the AUT representative there. Otherwise we had two professors, uh, one head of school, the vice chancellor, and probably the general secretary of the university as well. And the application came in to, uh, from the cybernetics uh, division, institute, whatever it was called then, for more funding. And, Professor Crank, who is immortalized in the um, Royal Institution's um, teaching services, if you, if, if you join that lot, said, or came and said, well, this cybernetic stuff, it's, my, my, my students are, are, my postgraduates are doing this anyway. We don't need that. 
Professor Clark was very good at cutting down uh, other departments which he regarded as spending too much money on television, never catch on. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, John Vasey, whose um, son was a Tory MP until he resigned uh, recently, but his dad got his peerage for finding, uh, there was a Labour Party, this is a digression, gals, uh, Labour Party inve investigation into the public schools which he was on uh, and whether we should keep them any longer. Anyway, um, they decided that they should and John Vasey found Marcy Williams, that's the Prime Minister's Secretary of the time, Harold Wilson, uh, got them a place at Vasey and he was in the resignation on it. Oh, honestly, uh, John Vasey would say, well, cybernetics look very good and very potent in the 1950s, but it's faded a bit now, um, hasn't it? Okay, so uh, what are, I, I would say, and this jumps very much with um, what um, Bill was saying, Sometimes we haven't noticed our own successes. There has been uh, a, a, an intellectual enmeshing, knitting together uh, from the chaos and complexity theories um, that there are loads of popular books about it, uh, that there is an intellectual heritage there from cybernetics. And even if there weren't, you could, they may have got up the mountain by a different path, but it's certainly uh, part of the common properties of large complex systems. And even if you got there somewhere else, uh, I would argue it should be uh, in, it, 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 it should be part of the subject. Um, is cybernetics simply a conceptual tool back like mathematics? To some extent, I I think that's uh, what uh, Bill was saying uh, could be a function of it and it's reflected in some of the earlier um, classifications of um, <laughs> cybernetics in the um, uh, art article about its reception into the um, uh, colon uh, classification system. Uh, so that's one um, aspect of it. On the other hand, I was set up, I, for my PhD, I told uh, David Stewart I wanted to solve the mind-body problem. And he said, well, let's start with something a bit more straightforward. Let's go and see, find out why people find cybernetics difficult. What are their cognitive problems? Um, and so you can blame the student or you can blame the subject. Uh, when I interviewed uh, students um, about whether they thought the difficulties in cybernetics were in themselves or in cybernetics, one student said he thought, you know, maybe, maybe the problem with me um, is, is with me. And I can't remember how many I, I just interviewed informally. It was seven or eight, um, I think. Uh, there are issues in cybernetics which easily fall down to the a lowest common denominator understanding, to use that in term in its popular sense, not its um, mathematical success sense. So uh, just exemplifying a handful of them, uh, requisite variety was um, presented to me as the one true theory in cybernetics, it is a very useful uh, strategy in a great many uh, situations. If you're a teacher trying to control a room full of children, you either increase your variety by having you know more material in your head than you see them having, or you try and reduce theirs by being, I'm not gonna have any of this nonsense any longer, or a little bit more subtle, you try and get them to, um, absorb one another's variety by breaking them up into little groups and solving uh, problems together. There are many useful insights to be got uh, from that. However, if somebody points a gun at you, uh, you can reduce an awful lot of variety uh, with a gun. Now you can argue 
that um, the, the amount of variety developed in creating a gun is greater than the amount of variety uh, you're destroying in the, in the system. But if, but if you read through the um, arguments for uh, requisite variety, there is an element um, of tautology. Uh, we're told that if you take the cases where just one set of inputs wipes everything off, it's not interesting. So we'll put that, we'll park that. And then looking at the rest of it, um, you uh, uh, can then develop a theory which says only variety can uh, reduce variety because you specifically wiped away the instances uh, uh, where, where that is not the case. Uh, I've explained that rather poorly. If you want my paper in Kyburn 80s around 1990 uh, on the status of requisite variety, if you, if you don't have access to Kybernetes for free, if you email me, I'll send you that. Uh, but nevertheless, the emphasis on increasing information rather than uh, single action methods of control has probably had some extremely good effects. Whatever, what other dodgy ideas do we have in cybernetics? Well, people tend to have problems uh, distinguishing information and what we actually mean by information. There's physical, uh, Mike Elstob described physical information and uh, kind of subjective information. Uh, I remember the man's name, Shannon, uh, did a very good job of talking about the characteristics of information transmission down wires or down any observable uh, channels. And cybernetics has uh, endeavoured to put information as a, a second layer of reality above and beyond matter and forces. That has been challenged by quite a number of people. It certainly works for um, designing uh, communications, electronic communications uh, systems. But arguably, the information theoretic view is that um, there's more information in a jumble of letters of the alphabet, arguably, than a line in English. It's related to uh, what's surprising, what is um, unexpected. Whereas if I've got a good grip on reality, uh, not that much, arguably, will be unexpected. Does that mean I'm processing less information? It's a rather long convoluted argument, which, again, uh, if you don't want to read my thesis online, you'll just have to work it out um, for yourself. But it takes us into uh, premature illusions of subjective and objective notions of information, which, in my opinion, can get flaky. Fuzzy concepts of feedback, uh, it's like, again, just like deciding what is an element of variety, what situations are feedback, how far do you push that rather useful notion? Uh, one of my, 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 my second PhD supervisor, Mike Elstop, argued that some people would say that a stone rolling down a hill, you could look at each uh, point of its transition through a phase state and say there is feedback there. Uh, there are a number of ways of looking uh, at it. Uh, the notion does give you some good ideas and the idea that feedback needs to be damped, otherwise you have an explosion or, uh, I don't know, this is me driving across the snow uh, on the way to interview somebody for my PhD. And I was going perfectly happily across the snow and little wobble. So uh, the car started going off the road and uh, I compensated by swinging the um, steering wheel around the other way. So the car went the other way further and a series of increasing zigzags. Uh, 
we're probably all familiar with that. Now, somebody said, given that I ended up in the ditch on the opposite side of the road, fortunately, there are no very few other people daft enough to be traveling on the road on that day. I should hand back my MSc um, in cybernetics. There, there is a difference between our implicit and subjective knowledge and our explicit knowledge. Professor Diane Berry did a very good um, series of experiments for her PhD where she got uh, people to control the variables in a variety of situations. I remember one was a model sugar factory and you had to keep, and there was delayed feedback uh, in that um, model. And what she found was that the people who could articulate what was going on got lower results than the people who couldn't say what was doing, going on, but were keeping the um, model within bounds. So we have in cybernetics some, arguably some people have been doing cybernetics all of their life. They just haven't, when they catch a ball or whatever it is, they just uh, don't realize they're doing it because it's not part of our explicit repertoire. It hasn't uh, needed to be. Um, okay, there's aspects of the uh, Vena's uh, fascination in trying to produce a golem, artificial intelligence. Theoretically, you can, uh, will ultimately be able to do, um, uh, to build the robot that can come out with everything that I'm coming out with at the moment. In fact, guys, no. Uh, uh, but we have a glitch about um, attributing consciousness to that robot. And you can go all spiritual and say, hey, there's some subtle layer of soul stuff, uh, which is impinging on, and this is giving you your all feels. It's just the same problem as saying it's sort of solid-ish. Um, uh, matter here. There, there, there are things which we have not got yet got right. Obviously, it's not just in um, cybernetics. About eight years ago, I was at a conference where um, somebody had written a book on Marxism and was um, trying to teach it to all of us. And he happened to be a um, postdoctoral researcher in physics at Oxford. Um, so I said to him, how can I believe all this stuff uh, that you're saying about Marx and Crux conflict when you believe in this flaky and embarrassing idea of action at a distance and you call it gravity? You will know that Newton kind of apologised to Bishop Barclay or somebody for introducing this rather occult notion. He paused for a while and said, well, the jury's out on gravity. Um, so again, we shouldn't be too embarrassed uh, by finding things in cybernetics which we haven't uh, resolved yet. Nevertheless, we shouldn't pretend that they are not um, problems. So um, my line, might a machine only think it was conscious? It's partly a joke, but it's partly to illustrate that you could have, um, maybe the vice chancellor here can explain it to us all later in the week. Uh, you, co you could have a machine which is processing a variety of inputs and processing that processing up to a level which, like you get with Gerdel, Gerdel Escher Bach, if you take people through an, an, an sufficient level transitions, their brains get befuddled and say, oh yeah, all right, I believe that rather like Penrose's um, theory of consciousness in uh, microtubules, which uh, under, um, is it quantum decay? Somebody here will know this a lot better than me. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, uh, Matt, unfortunately there aren't enough people in this room to start a riot. Uh, however, um, Oh, they're all great. Good. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, there is scope for more challenge in the discussion of second order cybernetics. And people who I would normally attribute uh, quite a lot of respect for in their cybernetic understanding have in very small groups um, 
said to me, you know, well, really, what has it ever done to us? Done for us? What has second order cybernetics ever done for us? Uh, I'm sure you will be able to think of um, a number of examples, but obviously a big aspect of second order cybernetics is taking the observer into our in, into account. And that is an extremely important epistemological uh, point. And in a way, it's what you might say screws up the social sciences, because just as you are uh, trying to uh, define, to understand uh, the other person, the subject in terms of the old fashioned stuff, their uh, feedbacking uh, back on you. You can remember in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it turns out that the, the mice are doing experiments on the psychologists, um, not the other way around. So, uh, and given as uh, Professor George pointed out, partly from Stuart, the brain is, can be seen as a set of flip-flops, uh, which you, you know, is what you get in computers, true, false, on, off, whatever. And you can make that conformable to a pretty high level with anything that you're capable of specifying. And uh, given the protein potential variety of human beings, uh, doing things like social science, uh, whether that is sociology, psychology, anthropology, history, human geography, literature, uh, fiction, probably with fiction is, it's not always true. Um, uh, let's see what else do we have, arguably some management studies, aspects of uh, humanity, they're always of approaching studying human beings. And I would say second order cybernetics gives you a perspective um, on that, that there is a conversation, a debate. You look at something like um, PASC's the, uh, conversation theory. In my reading or skimming of his very thick books on this, he is putting forward a very constrained form of interaction between experimenter sub and uh, subject. And hey, if you can impose a certain worldview on a mass of humanity, you can get them to behave relatively predictably for as long as they will buy into that worldview. But it is, it is problematic outside most physics, most chemistry, the kind of philosophy of science which we were taught at secondary school does have um, its limitations, but we should recognize that this is being addressed by other people uh, than second order cyberneticians and um, we, can, we, we, can, we can learn from them um, as well as, ev as everybody else. Um, Okay, the next uh, paragraph here points to the fact that if you look at up system theory on Wikipedia, you get a whole bundle of things which you know, I've mentioned here, systems, dynamic systems, theory, control theory, systems analysis, AI, OR, soft systems, methodology, catastrophe, some of the things that Bill uh, was talking about, and cybernetics. Um, is this not a horrible muddle? Or is it some kind of Venn diagram with um, overlapping um, sets of uh, things and you could spend perhaps, perhaps a fruitful afternoon uh, considering what um, is the, um, okay, can you take one and pass one on? Uh, what is the most uh, appropriate way of divvying up um, these subjects. I, my position is just as we've got a whole range of subjects studying human beings, um, it's okay to have a whole variety of ways up the mountain to 
any ultimate truths which we um, may decide to um, discern. So I've given you about 13 different uh, possible uh, characterizations of cybernetics uh, to some extent counterposed to all the other uh, things in there. I mean, you could just say cybernetics is the big thing which is uh, holding all together, or you could say it's the uh, purpose-like or bit of general systems theory. I personally don't care that much um, if it's a way in, you know, if, if I can teach a kid to spell by using visual methods or auditory methods or physical movement methods, I don't care as long as they can end up spelling rhinoceros or what, whatever it is that the system uh, deems important um, to their success in life. And I know we are going to have a talk about unification of systems, uh, theories and the systems movement later in the week. I think it's a great thing to try. My reaction would be to say, good luck. Uh, you'll learn a lot by doing it. I'm not convinced that we will get there yet for reasons I put further down um, the page. Um, just uh, for people still with us online, I'll attempt, when this thing wakes up, to shove in my um, 13 varieties of cybernetics, at least page one. It should be coming up in a moment. Keep you there. Yeah, I mean, it is there. I just need to dispose it. Okay. Um, so, again, I'm providing you with material which I hope is clear enough for you to argue with me or enlighten me uh, in this sort of romp. Uh, Say that again. Okay, right. So, uh, grasshoppering even um, more uh, radically. I think I would um, jump down to my um, favourite line, for, well, a couple of paragraphs from Kant, uh, which uh, when I read it towards the end of my doing my dissertation, I thought, bother, uh, the man has come to a very similar conclusion to me about 250 years earlier. And he basically says that uh, uh, subjects get round to their fundamentals a long time after their fundamental axioms, whatever, a long time after they are first broached. So given arguably, you know, the birth certificate of cybernetics is only about as old as I am, uh, we shouldn't get uh, too worried uh, and toothless that we haven't got that great insight. We should learn to live uncomfortably facing uh, the tensions between uh, various um, subjects rather than um, trying to close them down. And something I think that was uh, said over here about one of my problems with certain forms of philosophy of science is that they may tend to solve the problem by prohibiting you from speaking about it, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent, which I think comes at the end of uh, Wittgenstein's Tractatus, um, doesn't it? Uh, we all remember the operationalists, well, we don't remember them, but, but who said you know, nothing is meaningful unless it can be measured. Um, there have been these attacks on Russianism because no pure, um, uh, no perfect philosophy of science has been induced yet. I, I like a guy called uh, Newton Smith who has um, talked about temperate rationalism. We take guidelines uh, from our culture, from philosophy, from wherever else we can glean it. We have conversations. Uh, we try to come to consensuses and sometimes those are legitimate consensuses uh, sometimes, like when we decide to bomb the Bay of Pigs, they're not such useful um, 
consensuses and we need to live with that tension. So maybe it's a tolerance, a greater tolerance for uncertainty, which is going to be the inoculation, which we need to offer to our students. We're, um, we're talk, talking on the way up here. Clearly we need better images rather than um, straight mathematical formulae. Uh, to get across the first points, the first data um, from people. Can you actually win by uh, looking for great big generalizations rather than having your own focused area and looking at specifics as academia tends to be mostly? Well, we know most of the good new stuff comes out is a kind of leap from one area um, to another. So there is clearly a place, a need um, for cybernetics, even if you want to sort of remain much more concrete an awful uh, lot of the time. So uh, just to find, to, 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 just to give you an opportunity to come back at me, I would say arguably um, the remaining significant problems which we face either in our survival or our survival, um, are understanding or in, in the grasp of the behavior, the phenomena of large complex systems, whether that's a body, a brain, a computer, an ecology, an economy, an institution, whatever. Uh, I don't care too much what you call it, but one way in is cybernetics. Cybernetics does show a little bit more philosophical sophistication approaching these areas than what I observe in the rest of the systems theory. Therefore, we need cybernetics. That's a nice way of coding it. Um, well, in the absence of the observer, is there a system? <sighs> to, yes, <laughs> to me. Uh, but you, is it, and this is a bit like solipsism, isn't it? You can't prove. It's difficult to prove that when a tree falls in the forest, there's any sound if there's no one there to hear it. But it's like Bishop Barclay's. Uh, idea of solipsism. We're all living in our own little world. We construct these worlds. There are no wrong answers. Any dream will do. And then you've got Dr. Johnson kicking, I don't know, a wall or something mm -hmm. saying, I refute it. Um, thus, but I mean, it's certainly a good diplomatic uh, strategy when you're trying to move somebody from uh, who you see as opposed to you. Uh, into a more flexible space where you can persuade them or they can um, persuade you. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of the contested phenomena in cybernetics, which I was talking uh, about, people do argue, is this feedback, is this information, is this a variety, and so on. Uh, they, you can argue about it, but it, it can give you a useful way forward. I mean, arguably that's a bit like saying, me believing in punishment after death may, makes me a much nicer person than I would be otherwise, even though maybe taint um, so. But in terms of practically op uh, figuring how we operate in the world, what is more contentious? The notion of causation, a linear series of um, uh, one thing causing another, causing another versus system theory. I mean, Hume uh, would tell you that causation is a very iffy subject anyway. So that's kind of, I, again, I'm doing more uh, to quote Gray or say, hey, look at you, you ain't got um, this, this right yet. 
if it's working for you, that's one form of validation. If you can persuade enough other people that it's working for them, that's a second form of validation, even though we know that the whole of humanity can, most of humanity can believe that something else. But if it's giving you manipulability, um, arguably the fruits, the offspring of cybernetics have given us um, a greater level of uh, manipulability, understanding of all sorts of scientific social phenomena in the last um, 70 or so years, I would say, yeah, systems are real, systems exist. We have to, I mean, a lot of cyberneticians are constructivists. Uh, and if you look at how we come to understand things, the constructivist story works very well. But that, just because we construct our understanding doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's all wrong, or of course that it's all right, either. I'm glad John said that, about saying, I've always had a problem in that, other than the other end of cybernetics. I've always thought second cybernetics is an example of non-linearity. It's like the glasses that people wear. The brighter the sunlight, the darker they go. So the less light they transmit. So it's a sort of like, I, I, I envisage it in that sort of way. Things that you do actually affect society, you, mm. whatever. And that, so that the output is, you double the input, but you don't get double the output. Yeah. Not linearity. And then, I mean, you read the Wikipedia Second Order Cybernetics, uh, article and it, 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 it can show you sort of uh, its emergence, it links with other, other forms. Of, you were talking about Robert May's uh, non-linear mathematics and I remember the shock that I got over 30 years ago when he just got a very simple set uh, formula in, uh, yeah, yeah. In, na in nature, and you plug that into your computer, you plug the output back into your input, and it doesn't go to infinity or minus infinity or zero or a fixed number. It wanders all over um, the field. Now, somehow or other, this links up with um, second or, 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 or the cybernetics. The yeah the reactions and so on uh, aren't that predictable unless you constrain the interaction. Like, you know, we have a norm in this room at the moment that you don't start spontaneously singing or listening to uh, things on your um, ear iPods or whatever, which uh, helps to predict the behavior that with with other situations, we would be a lot less predictable. And um, predictability is not the same as um, a lack of free will. A device, a, a, throwing a device, a, a, a dice, the outcome is not predictable, but the dice doesn't have free will. Whereas if you throw something in my direction, I will behave in a fairly predictable, uh, manner, and that does not prove that I've got free will, which is one of those philosophical models which sort of haunts the um, certain areas of cybernetics as well. I think you don't understand probability. That's oh, that's so, so true, is it not? Yeah. Or you can make a lot of money out of people's not understanding yeah. probability, of course. Do the contents of the rules of the modes of operation set cybernetics different to the I think uh, you get yes and no answers from people who declare them uh, so, as so. I mean, to me, it's, you're laying, a con I have my conceptual structure of me and you talking uh, here. And uh, there, Ah, I don't feel myself doing that much different from when I'm, you know, I don't know, trying to solve a quadratic equation. Yeah. Okay, I'll I tell you why. I, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at first order cybernetics, I'm looking at second order cybernetics. My thing is obviously the first order cybernetics, you're looking at the first order cybernetics, the second order cybernetics, the third order cybernetics, the fourth order cybernetics, the fifth order cybernetics, the sixth order cybernetics, the seventh order cybernetics, 
mm. is largely similar. Yeah. Okay. And my fear is that the stuff that let's keep banging on about now, like the third side. Uh, Can we call it infinite regress cybernetics? No, no, no. We, 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 I have a reason for holding this particular set of words. Yeah. Is also similar. Right. Okay, so cybernetics is cybernetics is cybernetics. So we don't have first and second and third order cybernetics. Mm. We have first and second and third order systems, and we have cybernetics of. So cybernetics doesn't change. The, the systems that are applied to mm. do. Now, let's use a whole different. A whole whole different conversation mm. in terms of where they're taking third order cybernetics now. Mm. Okay, you read some of the RAND organization reports on cybernetics? I read people's reports of the RAND organization's reports. Yes, okay. RAND organization is very interested in cybernetics. Mm -hmm. Less own systems are very interested in cybernetics. Mm. At the uh, early 60s. Mm. And they were writing there, and it's going to sound like I'm a young person, okay? They're all thick, they can only think in two dimensions, and they get very long way into writing the process where you take that whole mm -hmm. They decided that the Russians had taken on side of this, they didn't be because they found uh, information engineering, Minsky Packard stuff, was much easier to do, which is one of the things that, that flattened this off because. Nice, easy arithmetic is on set theory. Okay, so based on all of that, we actually lost the connection stuff, which could now have this. Mm. We lost the reasoning and the, the second order feedback, which gave you the yeah. ability to integrate. It's particularly that. Anyhow, the Russians picked the stuff up and took it into everything um, psychology, education, natural language processing. Language, that's some beautiful stuff. Yeah. Computing, obviously, it also gets into computing and goes into defense. <laughs> One of the things that fell out to the cybernetics, which a girl called Diana chose to call it in one of the military things, mm. was that uh, Lefebvre was inspired by Ash. The Russians didn't like being a cybernetic. Stalin hated it. Um, and Stalin took over it. Stalin died, Khrushchev comes into power. Ashby, which I'm forever indebted to Nick Green, <coughs> on the of the forces of the introduction, the theories of games and cybernetics are simply the origins of the theory of how to get the other way. Right. Well, that's a good sales pitch. So when you take that one, and then you take past TG theory, conversation theory, and mm. teach that, yeah. what you actually have is not that these guys at the far end of Europe can work. And what they're doing then is they're building machines and raising interpretive mm -hmm. logic such that what they do is they teach us how to lose. And, and, and the actual teach back involved in Ashby's mm -hmm. task machine, for example, mm -hmm. is basically, it was very basic. It, it contains, they, they were holistic and analytic goals, more or less, mm -hmm. in there. What they've done, if you look at the way things work in terms of the way Russia speaks and the way the Fed, wrote about uh, reflexive control, which is early 60s, actually inspired cybernetics, mm -hmm. very heavyweight washing that way over the top of it, mm -hmm. is that starts to come all the way back through. Mm -hmm. So what we what we find there is that that underlies a lot of logic of cold war stuff and, and then the uh terrorism mm -hmm. comes from. <coughs> we know it's actually so we can understand it ourselves which we stuff we did. Mm -hmm. yeah. We know the Fed originated it in Russia. We know that a guy called Shevardnitsky also developed the first game theory in Russia, which is the same for effectively shape the, the ground under their feet. Don't push it, don't hit them, just change the shape of the ground so they roll around the floor mm -hmm. towards you. Okay, you put that into zero, the sun game, you get a, you effectively get, you know, the epigenetic landscape, which is effectively a man mm -hmm. decision landscape, which you manipulate by yeah. knowing your enemy. Knowing what you were playing around. Lepsky was the first editor of the Soviet Journal of Reflective Processes and Control. Lepsky is now pushing that as a method of um, developing functional democratic societies in the West. Now, that may be because it's falling out with certain things like that. Mm. 
But you need to be careful about how this stuff draws. And you need to understand that even, even in its most open and benign form, it is a mode of social control. You, uh, and it could be because what they do is that they're writing into it certain thou shalt put thyself last effectively. Mm. You can't make it self to mm. use that. So you need to be careful about the products you do and you need to think about it. So we need one, okay, I'm not sure about the orders of cybernetics. I think it's probably yeah, cybernetics is orders of systems. Mm. And so if we're going to apply that kind of stuff and understand it at the level that it's being understood in the past by foreign thinkers, because we chose years ago, we're going to be in trouble with these takes. So that, that's a debate we should be mm. I agree with everything you said. Uh, some of it I didn't have time to say, some of it I just didn't know, so thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the how to have a free democratic society, how to, yeah, ain't simple. And um, my experience of people say in, an outfit called Occupy London about a decade mm -hmm. ago. Yeah, some people are more equal than other people. Some people set themselves up as a defined. Obviously, there are a whole load of right wing challenges to notions of popular democracy, starting with Plato, well, probably from before Plato. Uh, but. Also, start with it, because I think democracy in my way. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're dead in the water. Yeah. yeah. So, it's all freedom to more like me. Yeah. yeah, and it's, I mean, the, 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 our model of society is either cooperation or competition towards an end, but what is the importance of that end? Uh, survival is a pretty good, good bet for most people most of the time. Okay, uh, one of our fellows um, argues that... Uh, the man who invented care, James Lovelock, um, only a few breeding pairs of humans will get through the end of this century, at least he did in one book. But uh, the, uh, you can find people who say it's not about cooperation, it's not about competition, uh, it's about co-evolution. Uh, what does life do? You're sure it competes, but it also cooperates a great deal. You only need to look at the... Um... Is it about legitimacy of decision in that context? Say again? Is it about legitimacy of decision in that context? Well, obviously that helps. And if you can persuade people that your process is legitimate, uh, as somebody who's had quite a lot of fun... It's a very electoral process. Yeah. It's only modified the next shooting of government. Yeah. So you, 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 you but you this is the problem with democracy or free free speech or whatever is you do allow positions like you're mm -hmm. suggesting the Russian state. Yeah. And you because that and they're the ones that take over. There's a sort of council within the democracy. Not you need to the council, we can't not that can and yeah. I think there's hope in the socialization of teenagers. I mean, you can get some uh, kids who are primary school are very egocentric, uh, but the social group which they, that they become part of as teenagers, they get teased, all sorts of things, until they are operating on a more equitable basis. And you know, I do not want to have a democratic participation in my decision about the sewage system precisely which we operate I, I i've got to be strategically ignorant and delegated to people who can choose the right people to do that but there are some things sound yeah. local planning or i can change things if um i really want to one of cameron's political advisors talked about the tyranny of those who are able to show up you know, if you if you can go to a meeting, if you can read several cubic feet of planning documents, you can uh, have an influence in the society. Okay, how you present yourself and so on helps too. But if you show, 
the Russian intelligence revolution was the same way. Mm. If, if you hear the Russian intelligence revolution from there at the end of the year, I'm sure it's great because it was so flaming hot about that I told them the Russian was going to turn up. Uh -huh. and, and that's well, you know, that, that's, that's the way. Wasn't there an election in the mines or something that voted against them? That's yeah. why they sent the troops in the first time. No, yeah, they fairly ruled it. Mm. Uh, I mean, but you get lots of different stories. I mean, mm. you get real ones about the aliens. The girl that took me out of Moscow at the time, the star, uh, clearly saw that there was a building over the road that burned outside of Moscow. It wouldn't believe it until it was built on the surface. And then we could play about the television boxes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But it, 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 there's actually a value in, in that kind of thing. I, and yes, it, it is a very Russian joke. But, but uh, that's, uh, that's what we're actually seeing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, the one thing that seems to annoy me. Ukraine and the war and anything else is so far, they're all linked. Mm -hmm. A lot of the Ukrainians are linked with Russian families and so on. They mm -hmm. phone up their relations in Russia and they get a really different stories. Yeah. Yeah. And you get tensions, cognitive dissonance, you want to flip one way or the other. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so, one thing we forget about our system is humans, uh, you have the physical system, physical structure, the research, what. But then we also have culture, yeah. and it's very difficult to actually map out culture. It's very difficult mm. to map out what's in here and how we would relate with each other. Mm. And one thing about the Bolsheviks were, Alexander Volkanov was supposed to become the heir. But the reason he couldn't was because of the culture Lenin had created over and over again. Yeah. And finally got removed. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, and totally changed the culture. And everyone's yeah. telling Bogdan, even though Bogdan was one of the nicest people. Bogdan was a thug. Well, he was a thug, but he was a nice thug all the time. Well, we know he wasn't actually, he was very awful because he was the one that actually advocated for mass robbery and violent repression, violent attacks on the banks. When, when, he, when he moved on, he backed out of politics mm. um, pre 1917 revolution uh, as a, a man. Um, the interesting thing is that he opened the world's first institute of blood transfusion. Yeah, so that's what he opened. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he started science, scientists. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, you, 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 but they, they, it, 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 they were different times. I, I, I take it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a tremendous point. But one thing is, is, is the culture. We, we, we agree. We like to forget about the culture of systems, even if we create or think about democracy. Everyone themselves have their own culture, not necessarily mm -hmm. like national culture, I mean, more personal. Mm -hmm. We have different things we want, we have different jealousies, we have different complexes, and that comes out and that starts to shape the way the system is. Yes. Even if it's the facto of race system, yeah. we've got the French Revolution as well, that was based on yeah. the Enlightenment philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. And then that grew up, that good generated into them killing each other off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it didn't even get a more even distribution of That's income. Right. 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 In terms of that, Tom Hay went to North America and wrote the Declaration of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom Payne was a useful. I mean, there's all clouds have a silver lining. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got the racial problems in Africa. So, yeah. So, so, so so extending people's systems vocabulary, I think, could, would help them, uh, you know, in self-understanding. I mean, one of the things I did as a school teacher with the oldest kids in the school was we used to get an annual rebellion towards the middle of the summer term. Hey, you can't really get us now, whatever. So I explained this phenomenon to them. And I said, you're not here to overthrow the system. You're here to take over the system, be this monitor, be that, show the young children this. And it was a, it was a useful reframing. Uh, and if you look for those things, if you look, you may find that, I mean, there's, the, there's an awful lot of ideas which we take in, but we don't consciously apply and often we don't unconsciously apply you know, them. Um, one of the functions of cybernetics is to learn an outlook. How to talk. How to learn an outlook. How to look. No, how to learn an outlook. 
Sorry, the acoustics here are wrong. Yeah, I think, well, I'm going deaf as well, but thank you. <laughs> How to learn an outlook. An outlook, yeah, got it, sorry, yeah. yeah. Certainly, yeah, and I think being, I mean, if you, it's a bit like Aikido, if you want to throw somebody forward, if you don't have the physical mass, you get around them and help them. Um, and look, you put yourself in the other person's place and one's capacity to do that and put things on hold. I mean, very often, if you explain things back to people, in terms of their understanding, they will assume you, that they're on, you're on their side. Uh, <laughs> you might be by the end of it, but uh, I, it, without, without having that capacity to articulate the perspective, which I suppose is linking to cybernetics, it's just a second order cybernetics, without having the capacity to articulate the perspective of the people who you're trying to influence, control. I, do, I, I, I don't buy in that these are the ultimate goals of us. I, I, I take you back to my, you know, um, what does winning, absolute winning mean? It, it, it's, it's, it's a nonsense. It's, uh, it takes too much energy. <laughs> I tried to stop you. It's um, four minutes to five. This is a good point of view, right? Which is going to be one of the keys. Thank you. Um, 